Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Welcome to part one of the series titled Marriage of Ali and Fatima radiyallahu anhuma. Ali was raised in the household of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Fatima radiyallahu anha was raised in the household of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they both had a special place in his heart. They were married by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were counseled by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Today, inshallah, we're going to do a deeper dive into the life of Fatima radiallahu anha, discuss her noble status in Islam. And there are some interesting fiqh questions that come up organically. And we'll answer those uh, fiqh questions, inshallah. And then we'll conclude with the love and respect not just the love, but the love and respect the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had for Fatima Radiallahu Anha. I have I've had a few community members asked the past few weeks, I can't get my kids, my adult kids to call me back. I can't get my adult kids to talk to me. So there's a there's a section in our seminar, inshallah, which uh, which will help us inshallah answer this question. And then lastly, we will conclude with the proposal of Ali radiallahu an. Let us begin. <coughs> every time, before I begin, every time I read the biography of the companions, you know, <laughs> I always, it makes me feel that, okay, wow, this person is the most beloved person to the Prophet So when, when we read the narrations of, of Abu Bakr, I said, wow, Abu Bakr must be the most beloved person of the Prophet And then you read the narration of Aisha. No, Aisha must be the most beloved person. No, Umar must be the most beloved person. No, it must be Ali. No, it must be Fatima. It must be, <laughs> all right. So, and, and for me, whenever I study these companions, they and when I'm studying the companion for that week or for that those two weeks or three weeks, they end up being my favorite companion. It, then this this just goes back to the leadership of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He made every person feel special. So today we'll try to make it as interactive as possible, as relevant as possible. If you know the answer, please say the answer so that we can continue uh, quickly with the presentation and we can try to finish the presentation. You can uh, unmute the mic if you know the answer or you can simply put it on the chat box. Okay, let us begin. Let me open up my PowerPoint. All righty. So we'll discuss the status of Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Some fiqhi questions related to these stories. We'll discuss the Mahar Fatimi, the love and respect the Prophet had for his daughter, the proposal of Ali. All right, this is the part where you try to quickly answer. Some of it will be from the weeks prior and some of it will be new. Go ahead. What was the name of the mother of Ali radiallahu anh? The faster we go over this, the faster we'll continue the presentation. So go ahead. You can put it on the chat or you can unmute your mic. What was her name? The mother of Ali radiallahu anh. This was a common name, even in Jahiliya. Anyone? What was Ali's wife's name? The Prophet's daughter. Yes, Fatima. Thank you. Fatima bint Asad. Fatima bint Asad was someone noteworthy. What was she known for? She was the first two who can answer this, who can fill in the blank. Fatima was the first two. Let's give 10 seconds for every question so we can continue quickly. 
Fatima bint Asad was the first Hashimi woman to accept Islam. Scholars of Sirah mention either the 10th or the 11th woman to accept Islam. Like Um Ayman, we're in Black History Month, so we definitely want to represent the Black Sahaba and Sahabiyat. Like Um Ayman, Fatima bint Asad was like a blank to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Go ahead, unmute your mic or write the answer down. You are correct. Yes. Hiya ummi ba'da ummi, a motherly figure. How many years before prophethood was Ali radiallahu an born? How many years before prophethood was Ali radiallahu an born? Close, you are close. It was 10. Why was Ali عن, raised in the household of the Prophet? Why not his father, Abu Talib? Why wasn't Ali raised in the household of his father? You are correct. Abu Talib was in um, extreme poverty, especially during the famine. So to help him out, the Prophet ﷺ came up with this idea. Let's, uh, and he came to one of his favorite, other favorite uncle, Abbas, and he said, okay, let's take, let's help our uh, beloved uncle, Abu Talib, during this time. And that's what they did. What were some of the names that were given to Fatima bint Muhammad ﷺ? Some of them, I'm pretty sure you heard you heard of, and some of them you probably may not have heard of. What were some of the names that were given to Fatima bint Muhammad? You are correct. Az Zahra, Fatima al Zahra. Very good, yes, mean. What were some of the other names? Yep, we, we got Zahra. Okay, she may have been called Tahira, but I've, I, I, I've, I didn't read, read that in the narration, but maybe uh, that is true. But there's one that was similar to Tahira. Al Habibatu Bintul Habib, the beloved one, daughter of the beloved. Al Habibatu Bintul Habib. Az-Zahra, the radiant one, the shining one. There's a neck, another one which was similar to the name that was given to uh, Maryam alayhi salam. Al-Batul. Al-Batul. Al-Tabatul huwa al-inqita' an al-nisa wa tarku al-nikah inqita' an ila ibadatillah. So the definition of Batul is the one who cuts off from marriage, the one who doesn't get married um, and devotes one's life to God, the one who is a virgin. So this nickname was originally given to Maryam alayhi salam, Maryam al-Batul. And the technical definition, لِنْقِطَاعِهِمَا عَنَ النِّسَاءَ زَمَانِهِمَا دِينًا وَفَضْلًا وَرَغْبَةً فِي الْآخِرَةِ She is separate. She is exalted amongst other women from amongst her time, from in regards to the religion and in regards to her virtues. This one is pretty interesting. Not many people know about this name that was given to her. Ummu Abiha, <laughs> the mother of her father. And we'll discuss why she was given this name. Ummu Abiha. And the one that is very common, Sayyidatu Nisai Ahlil Hadihil Umma. The leader of the woman in paradise. When was she born? There is a difference of opinion. Some scholars of Sirah mentioned this was during the first year of prophethood. Others mentioned this was five years. She was born five years before revelation. What does the literal definition of Fatima mean? I'll give you a hint. If you know what the literal definition of Khadija means, it will make it a little bit easier for you to 
know the literal definition of Fatima. He al Mauludu Kabla and Uana Wadaha Watahia. So Fatima so Khadija is someone who is premature, the one who was born before the full term. Fatima radiallahu anha, the meaning of Fatima is the one who is full term and weaned. Allati futima anha waladaha. Faslul walad anir rida. And she was named by Khadija radiallahu anha. And we know Khadija, we just mentioned, was premature. Okay, this one we should know. What were the names of the six children of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Khadija Radiallahu Anha in chronological order? Okay, we got Qasim. Good. And then? Okay, let's try to do them if you can. If you can try to do it in chronological order, that'd be great. Zainab, all right. Good. Ruqayya, all right. Om Kulthum. Okay, I see a variety of answers, but let's, let's go over them in chronological order. Qasim. Then you had Zainab, radiallahu anha, then Ruqayya. Um Kulthum was born, according to some scholars of Sirah, less than a year after Ruqayya was born. Remember, these are the, all of their mothers. Uh, they all had the same mother. They all were born to Khadija, radiallahu anha. Then Fatima, as we mentioned, there's a difference of opinion in regards to her birth. And then Abdullah. Did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have any other children? We just went over the story of the solar eclipse. So this is something you all should know. Baby Ibrahim through Maria al qibtiya Let's go over some dynamics surrounding Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She was the only child that was born and raised in Islam in the household of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you see those three characteristics, born and raised in the household of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What about Zainab? What about Ruqayya? What about Ulm Kulthum? Weren't they Muslim? Yes, but remember they were already engaged to their cousins, Utba and Utayba, but after that marriage broke off, we already spoke about Surah Lahab. Zainab, uh, uh, right, Zainab, before we talk about that, Zainab was married to Al-As, Ibn Rabi'ah. And uh, Luqayya and Umm Kulthum, they were not living in the household of the Prophet ﷺ at that time. And Fatima, when she was born, the Prophet ﷺ was attracted to all, of, uh, to all of his children, but especially to Fatima radiallahu anha. And we'll discuss why. There's a beautiful ayah in which Allah says, الأقربين, Warn your close relatives and warn your tribe. When this verse was revealed, Aisha radiallahu anha narrates, this, this uh, narration is in Bukhari, that when this ayah was revealed, call your closest relatives and warn them. The Prophet ﷺ got up and he said, Ya Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib, Oh my aunt, Daughter of Abdul Muttalib, he was close to Safiya. He said, "La ughni anki min Allahi shay'a. I cannot save you from the punishment of Allah." Then he said, "Ya Fatima bint bint Muhammad, O oh Fatima, daughter of Muhammad, salini ma shi'ti min mali. Asks me whatever you want from this world in regards to my wealth. Go ahead and ask." But la ughni anki min Allahi shay'a. I cannot save you from the punishment of God. Scholars mention that he chose to address these two in particular because he was close to them. Remember, the verse said what? Warn your closest relatives. He chose to address these two 
And according to another narration, he addressed Abbas, his uncle as well. But he chose to address these two because these were the two relatives he was particularly close to. And he was trying to make it a point that if he's not going to testify to these two individuals, he's not going to testify for others as well. And then he turned to the rest of his tribe and he said, Ya ma'ashara Quraysh, ishtaro anfusakum. O people of the Quraysh, save yourselves from the fire. Don't rely on me. Save yourselves from the fire. La ughni ankum min Allahi shay'a. I cannot save you from the punishment of God. Rawahu Bukhari. This now, these next few slides will show why the Prophet Sallallahu was attached to Fatima radiallahu anha, unlike and, and, and uh, unlike he, how he was attached to the rest of his children. Khadija died, according to some scholars, just a few days after Abu Talib passed away, just a few days apart. And this was when he was at his weakest. He didn't have any physical protection. He didn't have any emotional protection, right? He lost the physical protection with Abu Talib and the one who he would confine to, he, he lost, uh, his wife. A lot of brothers, they don't go to a counselor. They go, their wife is their counselor. So he lost that. And there are a handful of narrations which mention the number of times the Prophet Sallallahu was beaten publicly. Some scholars of Sira mention that he was beaten publicly at least eight times on eight separate occasions. Now, after the death of her, uh, of her mother, of Fatima's mother, Khadija radiallahu anha, whenever the Prophet came home wounded, guess who, take, guess who took care of him? The 10-year-old uh, Fatima, this 10-year-old, subhanAllah. She cleaned his wounds, she comforted him at the age of 10. And because of the compassion that she showed her father, Tabrani, in the Sri Tabrani, it is mentioned that one of the names that is given to her is Ummu Abiha, the mother of her father. She was actually another motherly figure for him. She didn't live during the years of comfort and ease. Rather, she witnessed all of the oppression and hardship and the boycott and people rejecting her father. Those of us, I see, mashallah, over 30 people on this call, we're all going over, you know, different tests and different difficult situations. Allah tests us in, in our own unique ways. And sometimes we think it's bad for us. Why is Allah giving me this test? But if you respond the way Allah wants you to respond, brothers and sisters, your status in society will rise. Not only in the hereafter, but in this world, people, your kids and other people will say, this person, he or she paved the way for us. This person went through that difficulty and now it's easier for you and I to tread this path. This is one of the benefits of going through challenges. So she witnessed the oppression. In Bukhari, there is a painful narration. This was the peak of his humiliation that Abu Jahl plotted and challenged with Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt to humiliate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by dumping not just the ins the, all of the insides of the camel, the intestines, the dung, right? Everything, the blood on all of this nastiness on his back. And Uqba, right, the narrations mentioned that he was he was big and strong like Umar and Abu Jahl. So he put all of this weight and he dumped it on the Prophet ﷺ while he is in sajda. Ibn Mas'ud mentions that it was so heavy that he, the Prophet ﷺ collapsed. And remember who is Ibn Mas'ud? He is someone who doesn't have a tribe. He is a skinny man. He's that same person who, when he was reading the Quran, Surah Rahman, they beat him almost to death. So some scholars have mentioned, they mentioned that Ibn Mas'ud, he went to the Prophet Sallallahu house to tell the family of the Prophet Sallallahu about 
what just happened to the Prophet Sallallahu And who did he find inside the house? No one other than the 10 year old Fatima radiallahu anha. She goes running to him. She pulls the guts off his back while crying profusely. Now, the brothers who are in this call, think about this. As brothers, as men, as fathers, we want to be seen as protectors of our women, of our daughters especially, right? <laughs> so imagine the scene, imagine how the Prophet ﷺ must have felt when his 10-year-old daughter is looking at him and he has this ghira that we all have, we can't even protect our own child, right? This is, uh, this is not only sad, but it's humiliating that having the feces of, ca of the camel and the blood and all of this nastiness dumped on you. You don't want your kids to see you in this state. Very humiliating and embarrassing. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right, mashallah, he is able to turn inwards and he says to his beloved daughter, La tabki ya bunayya, don't cry, oh my beloved daughter. Fa inna Allah mani'un abak. God will protect your father. According to another narration, he said, don't cry, my daughter, fa inna Allah nasirun abak. God will make your father victorious. But she didn't stop crying. She continued to bawl. And because he saw the pain in her face, this was one of the few times. Remember this, remember when this happened, brothers and sisters. This was in the early stage of Islam. And because he saw the pain in her face, he cursed and supplicated against the oppressors. When I say curse, I'm not saying like foul language. He supplicated against the wrongdoers. And remember, when the ones who are oppressed are making a supplication against the oppressors, watch out. Watch out for the dua of the ones who are oppressed because there is no hijab, there is no veil between their dua and Allah. Meaning, it goes directly to God. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam raised his hand. The Hadith in Bukhari, and he said, "Allahumma alayka mala amin Quraysh." Oh Allah, I ask that you destroy the leaders of the Quraysh: Abu Jahl, Utbah bin Rabi'a, Shayba bin Rabi'a, Umay ibn Khalaf. He named all of them, and they all died a terrible death. This is the power of du'a. You're not going to see them die right away, right? But I noticed that especially oppressors, the way they die, it's very, it's, it's always a humiliating death. It's never a peaceful death. And people are cursing them when they are, uh, uh, people are cursing that they have a bad death. <sighs> Beware of the supplication of the oppressed, not just by the Muslim, by the way. Beware of the supplication of the oppressed, the Prophet وسلم, also mentioned, let me, let me share with you this hadith. Even if that person is someone who rejects God, there is no veil, meaning that supplication goes directly to God. That hadith is in Musnad of Imam Ahmad, and that is Hassan. That is a Hassan hadith. So justice, brothers and sisters, is a universal right for all people in Islam. People have the right to be protected in their lives, in their faith, in their wealth, and in their freedom. If we fail to fulfill their rights, then we have surrendered our fate to their supplication. Now this, I wanted to ask you all when if we were in person, we could have had a really cool and in insightful discussion. But if anyone is willing to share on the Zoom chat, feel free to share. I'll be silent for about 20 seconds. Have you ever done la'na against someone in the past? If yes, who was it? You don't have to share who it was, but just think in your mind. But what was that supplication that you made against that person? Because I've had, the reason why I'm bringing this up, I've had community members say, oh, I, I didn't like this person. I did, and there's people that I know that are doing la'ana against this person. And if you have done 
if you have supplicated against another person, when you look back at this incident, would you have still supplicated against that person if you had to redo it because hindsight is 2020? So I'll be silent for about 15 seconds. If anyone wants to even unmute their mics or if they want to put on the chat, feel free to do that. I see someone writing something. <laughs> Brother Farooq mentioned that he supplicated against the BJP party. May Allah Ta'ala make it easy for our sisters in India uh, to wear the hijab. <sighs> okay. It is permissible to curse the oppressors in a general sense, not by name. Don't mention their name. And I'll share with you the hadith in Bukhari. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was praying the Fajr Salah. He gets up in Ruku'ah and then he says, Allahumma al'an fulanan wa fulanan wa fulanan. Allah reveals the ayah. Laysa laka min al-amri shay. Allahu Akbar. Allah puts the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his place. Laysa laka min al-amri shay. Oh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you don't have the decision in this matter. Oh, that Allah, Allah will be the one that forgives them. Oh, who will forgive them? Who will uh, punish them? That is Allah's decision. If we can unmute our mics, that'd be greatly appreciated. Brother, uh, okay. Allah says they are the Zalimun. So what did he used to say? Anyone? What did he used to say instead of cursing them? He would say, ma lahu turiba jabinuhu, rawahu Bukhari. He would say, he, he would not curse specific people by name, but rather he would say, what's wrong with this person? His forehead is dusted. What's wrong with this person? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the hadith in Sahih Muslim, la yambaghi li siddiqin ayyakuna la'anan. It is not befitting the ones who confirm the truth that they are in the habit of habitually cursing others, supplicating against others. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the hadith is in Sahih Muslim, Inni lam ub'ath la'anan wa inna ma bu'ithtu rahma. I was not sent to invoke curses, but rather I was sent as a mercy. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the hadith in Sahih Muslim, لا يكون اللعانون شفعاء ولا شهداء يوم القيامة. Allahu Akbar. What are the consequences of cursing against someone? There's two, there's two reasons why it's extremely risky to curse others out of anger or because of a petty dispute. Extremely risky. Two reasons. Number one, those who are in the habit of cursing others, supplicating against others, they will not be intercessors or witnesses on the day of resurrection. To be an intercessor, to be a witness on behalf of someone else, this shows that you need to have some hilm. You need to have some you know, character. Because that's an honorable thing to do. You need to be qualified to be an intercessor. And this one is really scary. The Prophet ﷺ said, when a person curses someone, that curse rises to the heaven, right? And then the curse turns right and left. And if it does not find a place, and if that person wasn't deserving of that curse, then, وَإِلَّا رَجَعَتْ إِلَىٰ قَائِلِهَا, إلى قائلها. It, that curse will return upon the one who made it. Allahu Akbar. That's extremely risky. That if that person who you cursed against, who you supplicated against, wasn't deserving of it, it's going right back at you. Ali radiallahu an said, Lu'ina la'anun. The ones who curse others are themselves cursed. Rawahu. Uh, this is in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, and it is a Sahih Hadith. 
it is permissible to curse the Zalimun in general. Don't specify their names. Imam Nawawi states that you don't want to curse someone who is protected by Allah or a friend of Allah. This is uh, the consensus of the Muslims. Now, do you know who is the wali of Allah? Do you know who is, who is from amongst the muttaqun? No, you don't know. That's a risk. Now, you can't curse. Imam Nawawi writes, you, you can't curse their characteristics. You can't curse the oppressors in a general sense. But not specifically. You are not God. You don't know exactly who is the oppressor. Sometimes it's clear, right? As the brother mentioned, he cursed the BJP party. Fine, sometimes it's clear, but I'm talking about against your own brother or sister. I'm talking about how there's people who curse their own children when they, when, you know, when they make their parents mad. But what if I've done it already? What if I've already supplicated against someone and now, you know, they, they may not have deserved it. What should you do? Just raise your hands right now and pray for their hidayah. Raise your hands right now and say, Ya Allah, this person who I cursed against, Ya Allah, I ask that you give them mercy. I mean, The best of women are four, according to the authentic hadith Rasulullah Sallallahu mentioned, Khadija, Fatima, Asiya, and Maryam. Once again, discussing the status of Fatima radiallahu anha. Why weren't the other daughters of the Prophet Sallallahu including in this hadith? When the Prophet Sallallahu was discussing the best of women, how come he didn't say Zainab or Ruqayya or Umm Kulthum? Think about this, brothers and sisters. Islam is all about effort. Allah is going to look at your effort and you will be able to see your effort. So Fatima and these women who were mentioned in this hadith, they exerted more than Zainab, Umm Kulthum, and Ruqayya. So Islam is not about nepotism where, oh, you're my blood. Yes, you have the highest level of paradise. No, th this is not Islam. <sighs> okay, I see brothers and sisters, mashallah, in our gathering who have been parents for 15, 20 years, 10 years. I want you to answer this question before you, before I answer it. How come my adult children don't call me anymore? I'll be silent for 30 seconds. Let's learn from each other. So this is a question that I received on multiple occasions. How come my adult children don't call me anymore? What advice would you give this person? Okay, I see someone. Okay, someone mentioned that perhaps they are repeating what they observe their parents doing to their grandparents. You are correct. I don't. I think it's and Khan. You are correct. Like father, like son, like daughter, like mother is not necessarily a myth. It's not necessarily a myth. And sometimes there is some uh, childhood trauma that happened that's unresolved. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, thank you for sharing that, Sister Khadija. Perhaps they are not pri prioritizing calling the parents. Right? We're, they're busy. So I asked this question to my counselor friend, and he gave a few reasons that I'll share with you. This one, the same one that this, uh, some of you mentioned that they're busy with their own family, with their own responsibilities. Some parents are high maintenance, they're hypersensitive and they burden their adult children. Sometimes the child and the parent don't have much in common. 
And now when they're independent, they don't have to spend time together uh, because they don't really enjoy that time together. Another uh, reason he mentioned was that conversations with parents don't always go both ways. It's always just a parent saying this, that, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. And this makes the child feel like, oh, I already hear this from my manager or boss. I don't want to hear this now. And as we mentioned earlier, sometimes there is something unresolved in the relationship. There is some old wounds. Now compare this with the standard that the Prophet Sallallahu and the love that he had with Fatima radiallahu anha. Why did he love her immense, immensely? One of the reasons that we haven't mentioned already is that the narrations indicate that he وسلم, spent a lot of quality time together when they were young. He kissed her a lot when she was young and this continued even when they were, when she was an adult. The quality time continued even when she was an adult. And because they spent so much quality time together, she imitated several qualities of her father. She still was her own person. She had her own personality. But this is the benefit, brothers and sisters, of spending quality time with your children. They have a much higher probability of inculcating all of your positive traits. The hadith is in Surah Nabi Dawood. It is authentic. Aisha radiallahu anha reports, Ma ra'aytu ahadan kana ashbahu samtan. I did not see anyone who resembled the Prophet Sallallahu disposition, his makeup, his mentality, his nature more than Fatima. Wahadiyan and his mannerism was just like Fatima's. Wadallan and her characteristic, it resembled the Prophet Sallallahu characteristics. Aisha said, when she walked, it was exactly the way the Prophet Sallallahu walked. And she said, Aisha said, Karram Allahu wajhaha. May Allah honor her countenance. Kanat idha dakhalat alayhi. And these five things we, we want to try to, now this is the standard, brothers and sisters, these five things. These are the go home points. If we can try to do this when our kids get married and they move out. Let's see if we can reach these goals. This is the this is the standard. This is in Sunan Abi Dawood. Kanat idha dakhalat alayhi that when she entered uh, his room or the house, qama ilayha. Number one, first he would go to her house. He wouldn't say, "Oh, you should come to my house." No, sometimes he would go to the house. Qama ilayha. He would stand for her. Fa'akhada biyadiha. He would take her by the hand. Waqabbalaha. He would kiss her. Remember, she's an adult, but she, he would still do this. And he would seat her in his place. And remember, because he would give respect, he would receive respect. The narration mentions that she would do the exact same five things with him. When she would go to his house, she would stand for him. She would take his hand. She would kiss him. The narration mentions that she would kiss him on both hands. And she would have him sit in her place. This is the standard, brothers and sisters. And this he was doing this in a society when daughters would be born, their faces would, would darken. And sometimes they would bury their daughters alive. Let us continue with the proposal. Now, before we go with the proposal, there's certain questions we need to quickly review. Who was Ali radiallahu an paired with when the Prophet وسلم, did mu'akha? Remember, when by the time they had migrated, Ali had become too old to live in the household of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He had become too old. He had grow, he, he grew up with Fatima. He was close to her in age. So the Prophet وسلم, appointed a brother from amongst the Ansar for each Muhajir. He was paired with Sahl ibn Hunayf. There's a narration mentioned in Sadlabi which discusses that Ali really liked Sahl ibn Hunayf because of his because of his integrity. We don't have time to go over that story. But read that on your own time. It's in uh, the book uh, of Sal by Salabi. So he lived with all the other single young guys. 
And the, the battle of Badr, it was called the day of great joy and the day of great sadness. Why? Does anyone remember? I'll give you a hint. Try to, re, try to think about the lecture of Uthman radiallahu an. The same day the Prophet sallallahu and the companions won the battle of Badr, that was the same day Uthman's wife, Ruqayya, passed away. After Ruqayya passed away, he married Umm Kulthum. Now remember, Zainab is still in Mecca. Umm Kulthum has moved out and is married to Uthman. She has moved out of the house. The only one in the household is Fatima. So she married Umm Kulthum, and now comes the proposal. Everyone from amongst the men wanted to marry the Prophet Wasallam's beloved daughter. She was the female version of the Prophet Wasallam, according to Aisha radiallahu anha. The hadith is in Sunan Nasa'i. It is an authentic hadith. Fill in the blank, brothers and sisters. Let's see who can fill in the blank. Some of the most prominent companions, including blank and blank, proposed to marry Fatima radiallahu anha. You may unmute your mic or you may post on the chat. Some of the most prominent companions, including blank and blank, proposed to marry Fatima. Yes, you are correct. Abu Bakr and Umar. This indicated, and, and but what did the Prophet Sallallahu do? He turned both of them away. The narration mentions, he said, not, not just that the, they're too young, but Mullah Ali Qari, he commentates on this hadith that when he told Abu Bakr and Umar that they were too old, there was another reason. Right? He wanted to marry uh, Fatima to someone who was a little bit more compatible for Fatima. So remember, Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we believe Abu Bakr is at the top, then Umar, then Uthman, then Ali. So we don't just, this hadith, authentic hadith, it tells us we don't just look at taqwa. Taqwa is extremely important. That's the most important. But that's not the only criteria. We also, this hadith also tells us to look at compatibility. Compatibility. We don't just look at taqwa and go into the marriage blind and say, yes, mashallah, this person is a namazi. He's, a, he's got a beard. My daughter, you will marry this, uh, this person. No. We look at their level of uh, compatibility as well. I was talking to a friend of mine. He was telling me that he, he, him and his wife watched this TV show called, uh, I forgot, it's on Netflix. I forgot what the name is, Blind Love or Love is Blind. I, I'm not, I, like I, I told you guys this before, I'm not into TV shows. They're, they are extremely time consuming. But the only reason why I'm sharing this is because there's a connection here. He said this TV show is is about single men and single women who are looking for love and looking to get engaged and married before meeting in person. Did you hear that? They're talking to each other through a wall. They're trying to get to know each other through a wall. They don't even know their skin color, how they look. <laughs> they probably got this title from the prophetic hadith, حُبُّكَ شَيْءَ يُعْمِي وَيُسِمْ your love for something or someone makes you blind and deaf. So on one hand, yes, it's good that people are focusing more than just looks. But we just went from one extreme to another extreme. One extreme is you. some people marry just for looks. Now they're not even, they're marrying that person without even looking at that person. <laughs> Islam is in the middle. Islam is in the middle. Right, the hadith is authentic. Al Mughira ibn Shu'ba narrates I proposed marriage to a woman. The Prophet وسلم, said, ilayha. Did you see her? No, I did not see her. The Prophet وسلم, said, Go and see her. 
فَإِنَّهُ أَحْرَى أَنْ يُؤَدَّمَ بَيْنَكُمَا Look at her because it is more fitting that love and compatibility be established between both of you. Allahu Akbar. The, the narration mentions that Mughira bin Ashtabra did this and he married her and he realized that they were compatible for each other and they had a blissful marriage. <sighs> Alhamdulillah, at our masjid, for our premarital education session, we have four sessions. The first session is in regards to the purpose of marriage and the characteristics that we look for in the spouse, we go over the hadith, Fal for bidat al deen. Why did the Prophet say this? Then the second marriage, the second session is two individual sessions where I go over the responses from the uh, IFN premarital response form. This part is really interesting because you really get to know why they want to marry each other and where they are at a spiritual level. And then, third session, we go over this really unique customized report called Simbis. Um, where they have a holistic or overview of their marriage and they go over really important questions that people usually don't ask before the marriage. And the last session, we go over the rights of the husband and the rights of the wife, according to the Sharia, the top reasons for divorce for American Muslim couples, what are their deal breakers and recommendations for talaq because a lot of people, they do talaq, but it's not the right way. So that is some of the ways we are trying to help people find uh, couples, find their partner who is compatible for them. Let me mention this story now. It's in Bayhaqi, it's in Ibn Kathir. Ali radiallahu anhu is the narrator. He did not think that he had, let me check how much time. Oh man, we got four minutes. Let's quickly finish this. Ali didn't think he had a chance of being accepted if he proposed to Fatima especially since Abu Bakr and Umar were previously rejected. There was an old female servant who said, don't you know that offers are being made for Fatima? What's stopping you from proposing to her? Ali said, I don't have anything to get married. She said, go to the Prophet ﷺ. He will accept your proposal. Ali finally said, okay, since she is encouraging me, I will gather up the courage to ask for her hand. Ali radiallahu an, when he gets in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi remember, this is a man of eloquence. This is a man who has many words of wisdom. When he gets in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ma an wa He couldn't say a single word because of the, the awe of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Nothing was coming out. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked, ma jaa abik, what brought you here? Why are you here, O oh, Ali? Ali was silent. Alaka Haja, do you have any need? Oh, Ali. <laughs> Once again, Ali was silent for a second. And then the Prophet smiled and he said, Fatima. Maybe you're here to propose to Fatima, my daughter. <laughs> the Prophet knew why she was uh, why the Ali radiallahu anhu was here. Fakultu Naam. Ali said yes. The Prophet asked, Do you have anything to give as a mahr? He said, No, Ya Rasulullah. The Prophet ﷺ then said, what about the shield I gave you? It's worth 400 dirhams. Ali radiallahu anh said, I have it. And then uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, I give her to you in marriage, send it to her and that will be her dowry. So that became the mahr of Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ. We can imagine now Ali radiallahu anh walking out and breathing a sigh of relief, easiest proposal ever. He only had to say less than 10 words, and it was also the most difficult proposal ever, <laughs> right? And Uthman radiallahu anh also helped. This is mentioned in books of Sirah that Ali went to the market to sell the shield. Remember, this was the only thing that he owned. He wasn't an extremely rich man. Uthman radiallahu anh, his future brother-in-law, offered to buy it for 400 dirhams according to one narration. According to another narration, it was 480 dirhams. And this was because he was wealthy. He was trying to help him out. It wasn't worth that much. Ali was hesitant. He didn't want to take advantage of Uthman's generosity. So he said, Ali, am I not more entitled to the shield than you? And aren't you more entitled to the money than me? Ali said, yes. Uthman bought the shield, gave Ali the 400 dirhams. After the sale, he gave Ali the shield and he said, this is my wedding gift to you. 
when Ali returned to the Prophet Sallallahu the Prophet Sallallahu uh, heard about this story and he made dua for Uthman as he often did. And he said, Rahim Allahu Aba Amr. May Allah be pleased with Abu Amr. He is the most generous of son in laws. The Mahar Fatimi, we'll discuss this later. I'm running out of time. Actually, the Adhan is about to be called. We'll discuss this, inshallah, the story next week. Actually, there's a few things. Yeah. So next week, inshallah, March 3rd, we'll be in person and Zoom. My wife will be making some most of the inshallah for all of us, and I'll try to help her as well. 7 p.m. to 7.45. Take care. Assalamu alaikum.